Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this celebration of Greg Alexander's new book, Property and Human Flourishing, published earlier this year by Oxford University Press. Uh, the book is really a wonderful achievement. It's the fullest statement to date of a neo-Aristotelian theory of property that Greg has been working on over a series of articles spanning uh, really a decade and, and maybe more. Um, and the book has a uh, kind of personal significance to me, not least because of the role that Greg and his thinking on property and human flourishing have had uh, for me personally. Um, throughout my career, uh, Greg has been a friend and a mentor and a collaborator. And in fact, he may not remember this, but the first conversation I ever had with Greg was over breakfast at the AALS hiring conference in 2002. And among other things, we talked about Aristotle and property and human flourishing. Um, I didn't get a job at Cornell um, at the time. Um, so I guess the, it, maybe the conversation was uh, formative for me, but uh, ultimately I did get here. So um, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great, a great introduction to, to property theory. Um, joining us today to comment on Greg's book are three very distinguished uh, scholars of property law and theory, Joe Singer, uh, Larissa Katz, and Laura Undercuffler. I'll introduce them, and they'll speak in that order. Uh, each will have a chance to comment on the book, and then Greg will have an opportunity to reply, and then we'll open the floor up to questions from you. Joseph William Singer is the Bussey Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Uh, he began his teaching career at Boston University in 1984, and then moved to Harvard in 1992. Received his BA from Williams College and his JD from Harvard. Uh, he then went on to clerk for Justice Morris Patchman on the uh, Supreme Court of New Jersey. And for our students who are interested in clerkships, I think uh, uh, Professor Singer is an example of the incredible opportunity represented by state high courts, which are often overlooked by students. Uh, every, anyone who knows Joe knows that his time on the New Jersey Supreme Court has had a long-lasting uh, impact on the way he thinks about property and on his scholarship. Uh, Professor Singer teaches and writes about property law, conflicts of laws, federal Indian law, and, and other topics as well. He also writes about uh, legal theory with an emphasis on moral and political philosophy. He's published more than 80 law review articles, is one of the executive editors of the Cohen Handbook on Federal Indian Law, and is the lead author on, uh, of what, what many discerning readers consider to be the finest property law casebook in the country. I think Greg may disagree with that. Uh, Larissa Katz is associate professor and Canada research chair in private law at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. Uh, prior to joining the Faculty of Law at Toronto in 2013, Professor Katz taught at Queen's University uh, on their Faculty of Law. She did her undergraduate work in, in law at the University of Alberta and then pursued an LLM and JSD at Yale Law School. After law school, Professor Katz clerked at the Supreme Court of Canada and was a litigation associate at Sullivan and Cromwell. She writes about moral, political, and social issues re relating to private law generally and property law in particular. Her work has been published in, in many leading journals, including Theoretical Inquiries in Law, the Yale Law Journal, uh, the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, and many others. Uh, Professor Katz actively works on issues in law and policy in Canada and the United States. She's presented to and consulted for the Department of Justice and Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development on Aboriginal Title and the Idea of Property and Law. She serves as a member of the International Advisory Panel for the American Law Institute's project on the restatement of law fourth property. Laura Undercuffler is the J. Duprat White Professor of Law here at Cornell Law School. Uh, she's a native of New Jersey. Professor Undercuffler joined uh, Cornell Law School in 2009. Uh, before coming to Cornell, she was the Arthur Larson Distinguished Professor at Duke Law School. She's also taught at Harvard, the University of Pennsylvania, Georgetown, and the University of Maine. She's published widely in the United States and abroad in fields of property theory, constitutional law, the role of moral decision making in law, law and religion, and others. Uh, she's been involved in international projects concerning property rights and regime change and the problem of corruption and democratic governance. Professor Undercuffler is a graduate of Carleton College and the William Mitchell College of Law. And like Professor Katz, she also received both an LLM and a JSD at Yale. Before entering law teaching, uh, Professor Undercuffler practiced litigation for six years and headed the appellate department of a large Minneapolis law firm. She was appointed to the advisory council for the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, on which she served for several years. And she also served as special counsel in the US Senate and has been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. I'll now turn the um, microphone over to Joe Singer, who will be our first commentator. Thank you so much. <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, it's a real honor for me to be here today to talk about Greg Alexander's new book. Um, in the very beginning of it, he says that his book presents an entirely original theory of property. That's a remarkable um, claim to make, and in my view, he's correct about that. The theory goes something like this. First, and this is, if, if you just had to remember one sentence about the book, this would be it. The goal of property law, the goal of all law, is to promote human flourishing for every single person. That, to me, encapsulates what I think the core idea is. And then the question is, what does that mean for us in terms of our legal system? Second, we have the right to be the authors of our own lives. And we cannot do that unless we have relationships with other people that enable us to develop both our capabilities and our values. Third, in our relationships with other people, we don't just have rights, we have obligations. And this idea of focusing on our obligations to other people, I think, is central to his analysis. Fourth, human values are objective. They are things that are good in themselves. They're not just preferences. The sentence, we should not torture small children by separating them from their parents, is a different kind of sentence than Snow Patrol is my favorite band. Although I do think it's objectively true that Snow Patrol is a great band. Um, fifth, the values that promote human flourishing are plural, there are many of them, and they're incommensurable. That means they don't just meet on a single metric. You can't add up costs and benefits and figure out how they fit together. You have to think through how they fit together and interpret them to see what they mean. That requires introspection, conversation, storytelling, as well as humility and attentiveness. Greg works through lots of examples in the book. One of the great strengths of it is he's got dozens of examples, and he goes into them in incredible depth. I think the best way that um, I can honor him is to show how his analysis helped me think about a case I've been thinking about for a long time. That's the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. The question of that case, the way I see it, is whether public accommodations can refuse service to customers because of their sexual orientation. The case seemed to present a conflict between religious liberty and equality. What happens if we follow Greg's advice and focus instead on human flourishing, relationships, obligations, and values? First, what values are relevant? There's a lot of them. And according to him, we'd have to think about things like religious liberty, equality, dignity, privacy, intimacy, authenticity, neighborliness, security, opportunity. I could go on, but that's the kind of thing that he says we have to think about. Um, and, you know, I, my time is limited. I would want to go through what do those mean? What do they mean in this situation? How do they fit together? Um, the second question I think he'd ask is what obligations do public accommodation owners have? In 1968, a restaurant owner claimed that he could not serve African-American customers in his restaurant because it was against his religion for white and black people to break bread together. The case went to the Supreme Court of the United States. They rejected his claim. They held that owners of public accommodations have a duty to serve the public without regard to race and that the owner's religious beliefs can't stand in the way of enforcing a statute like that. We learned from that case that owners have liberties, but so do customers. We learned that the free exercise of religion is one of our liberties, but so is the liberty to enter the marketplace without suffering invidious discrimination. A third question um, that comes up is, how strong is the religious liberty claim in this case? The baker, Jack Phillips, claimed that making him create a wedding cake for a same-sex couple is the same as asking him to conduct a religious ceremony that violates his beliefs. If he's right about that, that's a really strong claim. Nobody thinks that the law can force clergy to perform a religious ceremony they don't want to perform. 
the thing is, I've asked a lot of people, and wedding cakes are simply not part of the Christian wedding ceremony. You could make them, but they're just not. Um, and he himself gave evidence about that because he said he was perfectly willing to sell wedding cakes to Jews, even though most Jews get married in a religious ceremony. That's pretty perplexing. If designing a wedding cake for a gay couple means affirming their religious views and rejecting your own, then designing a wedding cake for a Jewish couple would mean that the baker had repudiated Christ. But he doesn't think that. And so that leads me to wonder about the strength of his underlying claim. If he's right, it would also mean that service providers would have a constitutional right to discriminate against customers based on the customer's religion. The 1964 Public Accommodations Law prohibits discrimination in restaurants based on race and religion. If he's right, I think we need to take the word religion in that statute and cross it out. That would also mean that stores would have a right to discriminate against Christians. But I don't think his claim was that stores should be able to discriminate against Christians. Store owners are not the only ones that have religious liberty claims. That's sort of what I've been talking about. One of the things about this case that bewildered me was the inability of a lot of people um, to recognize that gay people have religious lives of their own. There seems to be this idea that if you're a Christian, you can't be in favor of gay rights or gay people. That's simply not true. There are a lot of Christians and then people in other religions that don't have that view at all. And then regardless of Christianity, same-sex couples are Christians, Jews, agnostics. They're people that have ideas of what makes life meaningful. They have rights that are protected by the First Amendment. There's religious liberty on both sides of this case. Baker is asking for the right to make customers go elsewhere because of their religious beliefs and not just his. Customers are asking for the same freedom to shop that Christians enjoy. Our society has privileged the religious liberties of customers over those of shopkeepers. Now, none of that proves anything. And I think part of Greg Alexander's point is that we don't have syllogism or deductive reasoning that's going to just give us an answer. We actually have to work through in depth what the values are and what they mean. And given that the religious liberty is on both sides, um, I, I just sort of uh, I feel compelled to come out of the closet with my own religious views about this issue. Um, and so here's what they are. Um, I'm Jewish, I'm a Reformed Jew, and here's my understanding of what my tradition would say about this. The prophet Ezekiel wrote that the town of Sodom was evil, not because of homosexuality, but because they were cruel to the poor. There is a rabbinic story in the Talmud um, that says that um, in Sodom, people gave coins to the poor, but they marked their names on the coins. So poor people would have money in their hands, and they would go to the shops and try and get bread. The shopkeepers would see the names, and they would refuse to accept the money. The poor would die of starvation in the streets with money in their hands. And then the, the people of Sodom would come to take their money back. Um, the Supreme Court held in 1968 that Congress has the power to ensure that a dollar in the hands of a Negro will purchase the same thing as a dollar in the hands of a white man. According to Jewish tradition, as I understand it, the Saddam story has the exact same message. The person standing before you in your store is a human being, and we cannot treat human beings as if they hold marked money. When a gay man comes to a store and asks to be served, the way I understand the tradition, he is not the sodomist. The sodomist is the shopkeeper who says his money is no good. I tell the story not to argue that my religious belief should be enacted into law, but just to show the complexity of saying that the law should promote religious liberty. In my tradition, religious liberty is on the side of forcing store owners to serve people who come needing their services. Store owners are free to limit their business to people of their own religion by 
creating nonprofit entities devoted to religious purposes. Um, they're allowed to do that under our law, but if you open a business to the general public, then you have to open the business to the general public. And you can't discriminate on the basis of religion. And I think that that means that you also can't discriminate against people based on their sexuality. I want to end by talking about a Star Trek episode. Um, this is an episode called Measure of a Man. Data is an android. He's a robot, but he um, looks human, sort of. He has consciousness. Um, and there's a scientist from Starfleet that wants to take him apart to see how he works. They want to do that so they can replicate him and have other datas. But they can't do this without depriving Data of his consciousness, his being, his life. Data says no, understandably. But the scientist argues that Data has no right to say no. Data is a machine. He's a thing, not a person. There's a trial to decide that question. Riker is the first officer, and he's asked to um, prosecute the proposition that data is property, not a person. He doesn't want to do it, but they force him to do it. He's doing a good job. He seems to be winning. At one point, he turns data off completely, the way you can turn off your computer. Captain Picard is a defense attorney, and he's very discouraged. So he goes to the bar to talk to Guinan, the character played by Whoopi Goldberg. I mean, who wouldn't want to go talk to Whoopi Goldberg if you're feeling discouraged? So Guinan, in the Whoopi Goldberg character, says to Captain Picard, data is about to be ruled the property of Starfleet. That should increase his value. In what way, asked Picard. Or Greg Alexander would say, in what way does that increase his value? Guinan says, well, Consider that in the history of many worlds, there have always been disposable creatures. They do the dirty work. They do the work that no one else wants to do because it's too difficult or too hazardous. And an army of data is all disposable. You don't have to think about their welfare. You don't have to think about what they feel. Whole generations of disposable people. You're talking about slavery, Picard says. Guinan says, oh, I think that's a little harsh. Picard says, I don't think that's a little harsh. I think that's the truth, but that's a truth we've obscured behind a comfortable, easy euphemism, property. But that's not the issue at all, is it? Picard goes back to court and he says, Sooner or later, this scientist or others like him will succeed in replicating Commander Data. And the decision you reach here today will determine how we will, how we will regard this creation of our genius. It will reveal the kind of a people we are. It could significantly redefine the boundaries of personal liberty and freedom, expanding them for some and savagely curtailing them for others. Are you prepared to condemn him and all to come after him to serve it to you? We've been asking whether data is property or a person. But I think Greg Alexander would agree with Guinan and Captain Picard that that is the wrong question. The question is not what data is, but who we are. What kind of a people will we be? What obligations do we have to others? What relationships are necessary so we can flourish? Picard wins the lawsuit, and Data is deemed the right to be the author of his own life. There's a party to celebrate Data's freedom, but Riker's not there, so Data goes to look, Data goes to look for him. He finds him, and he says, Sir, there's a celebration on the holodeck. Riker says, I have no right to be there. I came close to winning, Data. I almost cost you your life. Data says, is it not true that had you refused to participate, the judge would have ruled summarily against me? Yes. Data says, that action 
injured you. And it saved me. I will not forget it. You're a wise man, my friend, says Riker. Not yet, sir, but with your help, I'm learning. Greg Alexander teaches us that property law is not about defining what property is, but about deciding who we are, what obligations we have to each other, and what it means to be human. We're not wise yet, but with Greg Alexander's help, we are learning. <laughs> This is a, a, a truly delightful occasion, and I can't say how pleased I am to be here uh, to celebrate uh, Greg's, uh, Greg's, Greg and Greg's book. Um, I, I first met Greg, actually, on the tarmac of an airport uh, in Kingston. Uh, Greg was climbing out of a very, very small, far too small plane piloted by uh, your dean. Uh, and I thought, there's more to the guy here than meets the eye. Uh, this is an unusual person. And this book, I think, is testament to just how unusual a thinker uh, Greg Alexander is. So I'd like to just take a few minutes of your time to discuss it and my thoughts and reactions. Um, in January 2017, the city of Vancouver passed uh, what it calls the Empty Houses Law. So the law requires homeowners to submit a property status declaration each year to the city, revealing what uses they are making of their property. An owner whose property is not rented or in use for at least six months a year is subject to a special tax, some have called it a penalty. So the stated purpose of this law is to address the affordable housing crisis in Vancouver, a city where the official rental vacancy rate is less than 1% and the actual they can see rate more like 5%. So by penalizing these absentee owners, the law is intended uh, to increase the supply of, of, of rental properties and to deter speculative property holding. So the empty houses law has uh, caused quite a stir in Canada. It has plenty of supporters, of course, but uh, detractors worry that it erodes the very idea of property. So I take it that Greg Alexander's account of property and flourishing goes a long way toward assuaging worries about the erosion of property rights through this and other measures to ensure property social value. So on Greg's account, the moral ends of something like the empty houses law is not an external moral, moral constraint on an otherwise unfettered property right. Rather, the obligation to contribute to the goal affordable housing falls on owners qua owners. The law is just an instantiation of a specific obligation that each owner has to contribute to the community. <clears throat> so the most important implications of Greg's work in my view are twofold. So first, it reveals a moral framework internal to the idea of property itself that guides reasoning by owners and non-owners alike about how they ought to relate to each other with respect to a thing. And secondly, Greg's work builds a firm justificatory foundation for state action. On Greg's account, it is not only legitimate, but consistent with the very idea of property for Vancouver to take steps to require socially valuable uses of property. So the glue holding Greg's account together, I think, is an account, or a principle rather, of consistency and moral reasoning. Each of us, of us owes it to herself to develop her capability so as to lead a good life. And each of us depends on others in order to do so. A simple moral consistency requires that each therefore acknowledges that others depend on her in the exact same way. This generates the obligation to contribute to the possibility of flourishing for all. Property comes in because human flourishing and human life generally requires some use of, and sometimes even control over, aspects of our shared environment. So for Greg, property's internal normativity is there just to be uncovered and to be given effect through law. The question I want to take up today 
is how to square Greg's account of property with a more widely held, let's call it modern view of property as just a matter of positive law. So moral and political philosophers with very different starting points, such as John Rawls, William Berkeley, and recently John Gordon, tend to agree that property is a purely contingent institution, a creature of positive law without any internal moral core of its own. So for all this, property is not necessarily a part of the basic structure of society. For Leah Murphy, whatever property is just whatever a principle of utility requires it to be. And for John Gardner, property is just a footnote to other morally salient institutions like court law or contract law. So of course, positive and negative property think morality matters in the development of the law. The difference between the moralist and the positive positivist about property is that the former, the moralist, thinks that property has its own moral foundations that stand firm and resist erosion by other social and economic forces. The positivist, by contrast, embraces the lack of a moral core in property precisely because it allows external moral, political, and social agendas to be advanced through the mechanism of property. So those who claim thick moral foundations to the very idea of property, as Greg does in his book, tend to end up in a very different place than Greg does. The law of the the standard of the all defend properties of total normativity in the course of advancing the view of property as a highly individualistic right that does not yield to the interests of anybody else. So I want to explore a little what progressive property theory gains and loses by building up the social obligation norm out of a thick moral foundation in terms of property itself. So I want to do so by exploring what I think is actually one of the most compelling alternative approaches to a social obligation norm in property. And that requires that we go back to the beginning of the 20th century to the work of a legal academic whose aim was to reveal that property is a social function. And also, who had the aim of scrubbing property free of any residual metaphysical ideas about persons and communities, any view that we might have had lingering over from the French Enlightenment, that we can understand property as a I have in mind the end of the it's a French professor. Long before he's really hard, he pioneered the quotes and other social fact. And in an absolutely amazing, riveting lecture in 1911 in Buenos Aires, Degree argued that property had transformed itself from the individual right to exercise one's will with respect to a thing to a social function. So Degree claimed that the transformation of property, tra uh, tracked rather, that transformation of sovereignty itself, the modern world he proclaimed linked state authority to its discharge of social functions. So no longer was sovereignty a matter of will, the will of the sovereign. In such a society, property inevitably is transformed too, just as a matter of social fact. Owners, like the state itself, hold their power only as far as they discharge a social function. So Degree, like Greg, intended his theory of property to explain the legitimacy of public interventions that require owners to fulfill their social function. So he thought once we understand properly the nature of property, we can explain the legitimacy of legislative initiatives requiring owners to make productive uses of property. We can explain, too, private law constraints on abuse of right, treating as wrongful exercises of ownership power purely to gratify spite or to gain leverage at the bargaining table. Now, like Greg, Degree accepted that property sometimes invited self-regarding decisions. For Degree, this was just a matter of division of labor. There's social value in everyone's flourishing and the burden of making sure that I flourish just so happens to fall on me. I have a duty and therefore a power to see to my own flourishing. Insofar as private uses of property are sanctioned, it is because private uses are themselves sometimes socially valuable. So indeed, the really radical implication of Degree's work is that property does not have a sujet de droit. It's not an individual right at all. It's just a social function that people assume, kind of like an office. So Degree and Greg come out in the same place. They both insist that a social obligation norm attaches to the idea of property. But Degree insists that property is made is because of the way we constructed political, uh, political community and the authority of the state in the modern so one implication I think worth stressing of this theory is that it's not at all a story of the increased strength of the welfare state weakening property rights. Instead, it might be understood as a story of the weakening 
power of the sovereign, and so therefore the weak need the power of the owner too. No absolute sovereign, no absolute owner. The fortunes of both, sovereignty and property, rise and fall together because they are of a piece on Degree's view. So Degree's account of property is fascinating, not least because it proceeds to analyze property as a kind of authority unavoidably connected to state authority, something Morris Coleman and the realist later picked up on. But it's also fascinating because it treats property as a new kind of general category, not a right, but a kind of office. An office or a social function into which private or public actors might sometimes slot themselves. But precisely what made Degree's analysis so powerful in early 20th century France is what might make it ill suited to early 21st century USA. The lesson he offers us is that we get the property rights we deserve. If we have a view of the state and community that is authoritarian, we get a view of property that's the same. So, Rex's account has the potential to transform a rights-based society from the inside by offering a view of the social obligation to owners that allows the property as an individual right, but just one that cannot escape contributing to the very conditions for human flourishing on which it depends. The very possibility of pro property serving individual or private ends depends on it also serving social values. So that is a compelling and I think unavoidable logic that speaks even to those who on the primacy of individual rights in the legal landscape. So having thought a little bit about social obligation policy over the years and measured my own work with property against how far I diverge from the closer friends, the better the closer, the worse the farther, I have to say that I am convinced completely that property entails social obligations. The question that we have yet to, I think, settle on or resolve is whether we think that the social function of property in fact, heralds a different view of authority and power, whether it's held privately or publicly. So thank you, Greg and Martin and everyone else for the opportunity to speak to you today. Well, it is with great pleasure today to speak about great to do property and human flourishing. I see it as a tremendous achievement and contribution think about property, not surprising that she produced it because his entire career was produced works of this magnitude. Um, one of its signature achievements is the demonstration of how property inevitably involves incommensurate values, which we've already touched upon. Uh, there are so many different uh, human interests that are involved in property decision making, simply too diverse, too conflicting, too Imagine a simple test for economic laws that would yield the best answer. The uh, interesting part about Greg's analysis is his assertion and his demonstration that we must and we can work with the situation, uh, uh, which is really something that uh, property theory has avoided addressing until now. It's the other signature achievement, though, that I want to address in my report. That's the question. Can we impose obligations upon property owners for the benefit of others? This really is, I think, uh, the deepest issue of property institutions, the study of property institutions. If property, <coughs> as we understand it in our system, is concerned with the protection of the holdings of individuals and it's concerned with the protection of property, what do we do? Effects of those property rights upon third parties. Does the institution of property itself have anything to say about the owner's obligation of property owners to others? Now, as lawyers and legal scholars, we're all familiar with the reasons why property rights may be conferred upon a particular individual X. X might be given property rights in the name of the work of labor and recognition of the possession of the thing or personal reasons such as need for security or ability to exercise his will or whatever. Uh, and when we get into trying to uh, reconcile these various views, we might in fact find it to be difficult. For instance, uh, when should an individual face labor journey from the idea of inheritance or not? 
person have one characteristic thing in common. They're concerned with whether or not that individual should be afforded particular rights because of his character, actions, and needs. Missing from this picture is any consideration of property owners' responsibilities to others. <coughs> of course, you could say, in uh, fact, this model involves implications or uh, a statement about the responsibilities from others. If we award a particular resource to one person, we are not awarding it to a competitor. Uh, however, uh, once a resource has been awarded to one person, there's generally nothing which would impose any obligations or duties to any other. You could say that the theory of nuisance is an exception. It's an example of obligation. One cannot one's property in a way that injures the enjoyment of property by another. This is obviously ill form and partial at best. It doesn't deal with the large question of how property owners or if property owners have obligations to other, even if ownership of the property itself is just its use. Now, of course, this is an ancient question. Uh, it's called the idea of property ever since human beings began to consciously appropriate themselves, which I think it's fair to say, probably when they emerge from the cave. Uh, theorists have tried to address this deficiency in the last uh, few decades in various ways. For instance, I would have to put my own work among these uh, perhaps inadequate <laughs> explanations. Uh, for instance, by delving more deeply into the nature of rights as an abstract concept, right? A right to a lot of people you think they are. I redefine property rights in particular as a theoretical historical matter so that they, in fact, continue to obligations. By seeing property rights as limited by tort theory, right? Property owners are actors and therefore they're responsible for harm that their actions cause. By arguing that government as the force of property rights owes the fiduciary obligation to all citizens, including non owners. Uh, an interesting characteristic of all of these efforts is that the effort to find a way to recognize obligations of property owners to others without any resort to a raw, what I call a raw moral theory. There's usually a much more fiction that rooting obligations of property owners to mushy, detestable ideas of moral theory is a tactical and analytical error. Therefore, most of us have tried to do obligations to others as something other than the idea of moral obligations. Greg's book, you could say, is the latest and one of the very best contributions to these efforts, uh, although he takes the question in an entirely different direction. He roots the idea of moral obligations to others in the goal of human flourishing and a surprise twist to the owner's obligations to themselves. So here are the steps in this argument. I hope I'm correct in these. First of all, flourishing is the both law and your property law in particular. Promoting flourishing follows the flourishing necessary to new capabilities such as life, even to make choices, sensibility, and so on. Secondly, these acts of influences social structures and practices, that is, societies and communities. Communities invite each of us to gain and exercise these capabilities. Third step, our need for community generates an obligation to community. We're obligated to support the community, others, who we, we need because of our own needs to uh, enhance our own flourishing. So therefore, in the twist in this theory, is that the obligation we have to support others is not rooted in their needs, it's rooted in our needs. He writes, for instance, this obligation is not based on reciprocity owing something to others. It does not have a contractarian basis. Rather, it's based on the obligation each of us owes to ourselves to live well. If I live my life, I value my life, it's the way I do, I must maintain conditions to make my life as good as possible. These include supporting the communities which are important to my flourishing. Uh, so under this theory, we have a approach 
where we have obligations on them not because of their needs or the impact of our actions on their needs, but obligations because of obligations to ourselves, a far basis, which makes this uh, so interesting. Now, I would say that there are many great strengths in this brilliant approach. First of all, it defines what we do is everything matter, right? We are honest with ourselves. We support the communities where we live because of what they do for us in the living of our lives. That is an undeniable thing. fact for just about everyone. Secondly, this approach is extremely important because it does not require that people be altruists in order to recognize an obligation to the communities. The approach is the obligation to our communities rather than some forced and detestable recognition of the needs of others. The question I would like to ask Craig is this. How does this vision or approach Within his larger, which I know that he has, and if the book as I'll explain, illustrates a larger moral framework uh, that we normally associate with these questions. Another way to look at this, one could read this approach to imply that we really don't need or shouldn't use moral theories at large when it comes to the ultimate questions that property involves. Is that possible? Uh, is that what the great communities do? Or is there some deeper connection between um, these ideas? Consider, for instance, the following classic scenario. Individual property owners put tons of food in a warehouse while starving people, people clamor for food outside. Um, one could say, well, approach that Greg has so brilliantly articulated what people inside should do is reflect on what they put in themselves and the way they take it to support their flourishing and that has to be them to figure out how to deal with those outside. Uh, although that may sound odd, there is of course again a deep truth to this. Uh, it describes what we do. When faced with clamoring gloves, most of us are I think it's less controversial to say that we are interested in self-preservation or healthy than it is to say that we can suddenly be by uh, altruism that would cause us to put our own needs at risk. Um, furthermore, one could say it doesn't make any difference which approach you use, because either way there should be a distribution, whether you're doing it for your own reasons or you're doing it for the needs of the others, either way uh, you would end up some sort of redistribution. My question is, is there any caution that Greg would uh, discuss or with which he would frame this approach? Is there a danger that something might be more <coughs> in this process? And in this regard, I found chapter 7 of the book particularly interesting. Uh, chapter 7 deals with the question of material reparation for historical wrongs such as slavery, casting the title, and grievous acts. Um, so the question is, in these situations, is anything lost in the use of an approach that focuses on our own needs? Or must, by the very nature of the question, must it focus on something else? You could say, in these cases, there were definite wrongs, right? Whatever the practicalities of contours and remedies it's impossible really to talk about these situations without the wrong, uh, wrong around the injustice and so on. Um, in other words, it's difficult in such context to say that the obligation can be separated from moral reasons or that moral reasons are not more important than reasons rooted in a, uh, a less contestable idea of self uh, preservation. And in addition, as I stood back and considered this book together with Greg's other work, I have to feel it in three. Chapter 7 contains very, uh, some very strong things about this. For instance, he talks about Jewish values and moral obligations to descendants of former slaves. And in that discussion, he used 
the moral phrase right up front. Uh, he also talks about the fact that reciprocity might have a role in this kind of case. He talks about corrective and restorative justice being a possibility for redress. Um, and he also emphasizes the fact that in these kinds of cases, the party agency of victims is important consideration. Uh, I would just close by saying that without the uh, Greg is one of the most morally concerned scholars you might have ever known. Uh, his work is absolutely fused with dressing up his brother, as you might imagine. That's the reason that he wrote this book, choosing a basis that is the least uh, contentious. So my question is, how does this fit together? How does the book's contribution fit together with the rest of his work? And does his approach as articulated in the book have room for or even demand uh, a more potential imperative in property? Thank you all three for um, your incredibly kind and gracious comments. I, um, uh, I really don't know what to say except thank you very much. Uh, um, I, I worked very hard on the book and so the, uh, your comments really uh, uh, made all of that work um, um, seem worthwhile. And thank all of you for coming. I'm, uh, I'm really deeply moved by your presence, um, sincerely so. It means a, a great deal to me, um, especially since uh, this is almost certainly going to be the last of these occasions for me as I'm heading off to the California sunset. Um, uh, so um, let me make a few comments and then responses. Um, by the way, this format really seems odd to me. I, uh, we have three panelists <laughs> here sitting next to each other, and I'm standing removed here. This feels like the format for a TV game show. <laughs> so, so for $500, Joe, uh, what is the largest planet in the solar system? <laughs> Um, so, um, there are three basic moves uh, in the theory. Um, first, I adopt uh, a social or what some have called uh, holistic, uh, that's a term that I don't use, but others have applied uh, to my theory. Um, but I prefer to call it a social ontology rather than uh, uh, the individualistic ontology that is far more conventionally adopted uh, by liberal property theorists. Um, and that's a, a really important move to understand um, because, um, and I'm going to elaborate on this in my uh, responses to um, Joe, Larissa, and Laura. Um, it, it really explains my understanding of what human beings are like um, and why there are obligations uh, on owners um, as owners and as human beings. Um, uh, by a social ontology, I mean I understand human beings um, uh, uh, to be literally dependent uh, from the very moment of their birth all the way through their lives until they die, dependent on other persons. And that is an inevitable fact of the matter. 
in my view. Um, this is straight out of Aristotle, for those of you who are uh, familiar with Aristotle. Um, and it strikes me as just obviously the case. Uh, but if you think about it, it has profound implications leading to certain obligations. That's the first move. The second move is that um, I base property on the Aristotelian ideal of human flourishing um, rather than um, utility maximization or autonomy, which are the more conventional bases uh, for uh, liberal property theory today. Um, the third move is uh, what Joe, Larissa, and Laura have really focused on, and that is um, the theory sh shifts the focus from rights to obligations and responsibilities. Um, and uh, it, it's really, uh, I think, in entirely appropriate that Larissa talked about Degui. Um, uh, Degui's work uh, influenced me uh, as well as the work of um, uh, German legal theorists uh, and uh, German um, uh, constitutional property law. Um, for those of you, I'm, and I suspect that is virtually all of you who are unfamiliar, uh, the German constitutional property clause, unlike ours, um, has three parts. The second part of which is uh, really quite interesting and very different from the American property clause. Uh, after recognizing um, property as a constitutionally protected institution and value, it then goes on to say, owners owe obligations. Ownership comes with obligations. There is a social obligation of ownership. We, of course, have nothing remotely like that in our Constitution. Um, and I spent uh, an entire semester in Germany studying the practical legal consequences of that clause. Um, so, um, I argue that private ownership of property is justified insofar as it facilitates the opportunity of persons to live flourishing lives. Um, and human flourishing should be the goal that property law seeks to realize. Um, I further argue that a, a person's flourishing should be measured by certain capabilities that he or she has, rather than by the extent to which she satisfies subjective preferences. Um, what is important is that a person has certain fundamental capabilities, such as health, education, um, not whether she exercises capabilities, but whether she simply has those capabilities. Whether she exercises them or not is completely up to her. Um, uh, so this is not a, a, an intrusive uh, theory, uh, but a, a freedom enabling theory. Uh, a person cannot live, however, a flourishing life without having certain fundamental uh, capabilities. Um, Flourishing serves two functions um, in the theory. First, it provides a criteria for um, the allocation of entitlements to property. And uh, in several chapters, I lay out exactly what I mean by allocation of entitlements in various ways. Um, constitutional protection of property, uh, there's a chapter on housing, there's a chapter on uh, race, uh, there's a chapter on obligations to future generations, um, and human flourishing uh, is the criterion by which uh, uh, I suggest 
we can fruitfully analyze all of these um, in incredibly um, massive uh, allocational problems. Uh, the second function is more fundamental, and that is to expound the concept of ownership and to delineate the moral and legal obligations that property owners owe to members of their communities. It's not simply a matter of obligations to individuals, but obligations to individuals as members of communities to which we belong. Uh, I, I stress here the importance of membership in communities because it is from membership within communities that we ourselves derive these capabilities. We don't, nobody acquires these capabilities on their own. Again, uh, I have a social ontology. We depend upon other communities, such as our family, our schools, our neighborhoods, um, places where we work, a, a vast variety, network of communities to which all of us belong uh, in different ways. Those are the matrices that uh, inculcate in us, that provide us with these necessary capabilities. Um, and flourishing um, delineates the obligations that uh, we owe to these communities. Um, now, um, I'd like to pick up first on Laura's uh, point, um, her really penetrating question, how my theory fits with the larger moral theory. Um, what role does moral theory play? Um, it's an excellent question, Laura, and the answer to it is really uh, quite straightforward. Focusing on our needs, our needs vis-a-vis -vis flourishing is itself a moral question. Um, the, the question that the person you pose will ask herself what are my needs, will not simply be what are my needs to um, uh, satisfy my preferences, but what are my needs to flourish in any given situation? And that is a moral question. So that a person must have a, a moral theory in order to answer that question. To know what my needs are, I have to have, crudely or in a sophisticated way, some kind of underlying moral theory. All right? Um, uh, Joe, I think uh, raising the uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop case is uh, uh, spot on, um, and it allows me to make just a, a comment about one of the capabilities um, that I think is, is necessary, I think it's an obvious one, and that is autonomy. Um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, religious liberty was raised in that case. Um, religious liberty, of course, uh, is an aspect of autonomy. Uh, more broadly. Um, my perspective of my conception of autonomy is, I think, one that um, the cake shop owner did not share. Uh, I suspect that uh, his conception of autonomy or liberty was uh, individualistic, um, negative. Keep your hands off of me. That's the conventional liberal conception of autonomy. It seems to me that's a pretty impoverished way of thinking about autonomy. I think a, a far richer way of thinking about individual autonomy is one that takes into account my relationship with other people. 
It's precisely because nobody lives in isolation that nobody can understand what it means to be free except in terms of our relationship with other people. And that will require us to think about what obligations we owe to other people. So more concretely, if I'm not able to understand the perspective, not agree with, but simply understand the perspective of somebody whose opinions are very different from my own, if I just reject them out of hand and regard such a person as um, a, a cretin, I'm unfree in a certain way. I'm a prisoner of prejudices. I lack autonomy in a robust sense. It's that kind of autonomy that it seems to me really matters here. And from that perspective, the cake shop owner, it seemed to me himself, lacked autonomy. So an autonomy analysis in that case, it seems to me, makes the case easy against his claim. Um, uh, Larissa, as I say, uh, I think you're, you're absolutely right in um, uh, pointing out the compatibility between my views and uh, De Guise. I would only add to it that um, in your uh, useful distinction between moralists and positivists, um, you're also right that Whereas moralists usually uh, have an individualistic valence, what I set out to do in this book is to shift that valence. I, I self-consciously set out to shift the valence to a social direction. All right, so again, thank you very much and thank you for your patience.